to go on this vacation. October 9th, we left Richmond. On the 11th, we made it to Pismo Beach, California. Oh, what an amazing shoreline. And Lucas was so fascinated by it. Oh yeah, it was magical. By that point, we were exhausted. That was the night that we ordered salad from Gino's Pizza that was later found to contain E. coli number of people affected by it nationwide by E. coli and is health officials now point to romaine lettuce as the culprit. That has sickened 40 people. 28 have been hospitalized so far. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have issued a statement issuing a major food warning just before Thanksgiving. It says do not eat romaine lettuce. A major outbreak last year. There have been cases in 11 states going all the way from Massachusetts to California. It's E. coli 0157H7, a particularly vicious strain of E. coli that can cause your kidneys to really basically shut down. Wednesday, October 17th, we went through Disneyland Park that day. We didn't really notice anything. Stayed for the fireworks. But the next day, that's when we really started to see the signs. Lucas is very sick. We all came to a decision. We have to leave. And we started driving home. We were in a race for our lives and we didn't know. The point where Lucas lost his ability to talk was more around um, October 21st. I mean, when he went to bed, I was the last person to ever hear him talk. When he said, oh, Daddy, I love you, and that was it. They knew his kidneys were failing. They had taken a diaper sample. They had finally concluded it was E. coli. Uh, I was in the CTU with Lucas the day that the story broke that um, the FDA had announced that there was a massive E. coli outbreak and they were looking for the farm. Lucas. Hi, baby. And I remember seeing his pupils and his eyeballs circle around like he was doing somersaults in his head. After that first brain injury, he had a second one and it left more damage. And what we were left with was a child clinging to life. Where's the lights? Oh, close. Get up around 7.38, start our day. I mean, what you, what you see with Lucas is what you're getting right now. He lies, he lies down on his side. I keep him in a position where he's lying on his stomach just in case for whatever reason he vomited. It's not gonna obstruct his airway because he's G-tube fed, it's a regulated time so it's about an hour that it is to feed him uh, his medications. So I mean, right now, if Lucas wants anything in life, he gets frustrated very quickly. He will start to cry. He will start to make cooing sounds. He's trying to communicate to the best of his ability what he needs in that moment. And it's all up to interpretation. I honestly believe that you are safer eating ground beef today when it comes to foodborne pathogens than you are eating leafy greens. The USDA, their level of involvement is significantly different than the FDA. Here we have multiple federal agencies, working with multiple state agencies, and they're not all using the same exact standards, the same exact funding, the same amount of resources, the same number of inspectors. If you were to go on a cross-country road trip, your food safety level of regulation and, and standards that you would encounter would definitely change based on the zip code that you're in at the time. Every year in America, we have some 47.8 million Americans who become sick from foodborne illness. 128,000 are hospitalized, and some 3,000 American consumers die every year from foodborne illness. Hello, 
this is the United States of America. How come we're not able to prevent this? You have to think about where does this particular bacteria come from? It lives in the intestinal tracts of cows, of cattle. And what happens is those cattle excrete the organism, it gets into the environment. If there's any type of runoff, any type of way for this organism to make its way into the fields, it'll get into those leafy greens. In the tracebacks, looking at the places where the lettuce was consumed and going backwards in the supply chain to where it likely came from. There were certain farms that came up repeatedly. FDA, along with state authorities and our colleagues from CDC, went to those farms. And in this outbreak in the fall of 2018, found the organism sitting in a reservoir in the sediment of a reservoir located on the farm. I don't, I don't tend to name names, so. One of the things to know about the way lettuce is grown in the United States is that there's two seasons. There's the summer season and there's the winter season. These outbreaks that have been seen in recent years seem to occur with lettuce that's in that transitional period between when growing is moving from north to south or from south back to north. <laughs> During the summer months, virtually every salad, taco, hamburger that's got lettuce on it, all of the, all those leafy greens are grown within 100 miles of where we're sitting right now. In 2006, there was a major outbreak of E. coli, and it was ultimately traced to California-grown spinach. And so in the aftermath of that outbreak, the industry got together with the state government and developed the LGMA, which was a means for the entire industry to change how they were addressing food safety and to ensure that everybody was doing everything that they could uh, to raise the bar. Membership of the LGMA is voluntary, um, but 98 to 99 percent of all the leafy greens produced are sold by our members. So there really aren't very many companies that are not members of the LGMA who could be members of the LGMA. We've always had water testing requirements, we've always had water regulations, but we recognize coming out of that event um, that we needed to do more. The interface between the kind of the rural and the urban, you know, right here, so the, the agricultural land being, uh, you know, about 100 feet away from a housing tract. It's California agriculture, so. One of the recent changes the LGMA has made um, in response to some of the lessons learned from the outbreaks in 2018 is uh, one of the new requirements has been is that we have to treat any open source water that's being used for overhead irrigation um, in the later production period. And we have very uh, pretty strict water standards that we have to follow with the LGMA. So on a monthly basis, um, we are still checking our, our water quality. Um, we've inspected it before we even planted it. We inspected it uh, within a week of harvest. And one of the things we do even above and beyond all those inspections is we'll come through and we'll actually gather what we call a tissue sample. So we will go into the field, grab romaine leaves, put them in a bag and go have those analyzed at a lab before we open the field up for harvest. Ready to, ready to harvest. The pre-harvest testing isn't a requirement of LGMA, but that's one of the things that our company chooses to do.
Um, I did receive results uh, yesterday evening that this field has uh, come back negative for all the microorganisms we test for. So um, with that coming back negative, we were able to start the harvest today. Currently right now, they're um, harvesting romaine. Uh, they're throwing it up onto a packing table where there's four individuals up on the packing table that are taking those heads and packing them into reusable plastic containers. Today, this romaine is going to go um, back into the southeast, typically from about, you know, right about April 1st, um, right up to a couple weeks out from now, about the middle of November. And so our romaine does go nationwide. I have a rule with my kids at home that if we grow it, they have to eat it. But that's also the reason why it's uh, so important that we follow the, the food safety practices that we have because I am taking this home to my family. You like your new mat? Yeah. Food safety is something that's never going to be something that's here today and gone tomorrow. We're always going to be focused on food safety. And that focus requires technology and policy and regulation and action at every step from the farm to the table. But when it comes to that family who's dealing with someone who's sick or worse because of something like this, they don't care if it's regulated by the USDA or the FDA. They don't care if it's from Yuma, Arizona or the Central California coast. They don't care if the contamination is from the water or from the ground source. To them, it never should have been sold or served to them if it was contaminated, period. There should never have been a need for a recall because it should have been identified, tested and, and removed before it was entered into commerce. Mm -hmm. So one foot forward, whoop, with a bend. Hold this for a couple seconds, get that good stretch in the hamstring. Now consumers want to see government action and industry response to prevent this from being the story of 2020 as well. This is going to be a very long life. He's going to live out the full natural life that he has. So if he's living 70 years, he outlives me. You know what the scary part is? I can only do so much. What happens when I'm gone? I mean, everybody's gonna be affected by this in their own way. I mean, this is like casting a stone in a pond to watch it ripple. Those ripples just get bigger and bigger and bigger. 